Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Big Bass Podcast, the fishing show where size matters. My name is Ken Duke. And I'm Terry Battisti. Our producer and engineer is Nathan Benson. Before we kick off this episode of the Big Bass Podcast, we'd like to ask a favor. If you're coming back to the show because you enjoyed previous episodes, or if you're a first-time listener, please click the subscribe button and the notification bell now. By subscribing and hitting the bell, you'll be notified of each new post, and you'll really help us to build this channel into something more special than it already is. We hope you'll also check out the website, thebigbasspodcast.com. There you'll find all our shows, special bonus material, our exclusive Big Bass Podcast calculator, and lists of all the state and world record bass. So again, let's get started. Terry, this episode of the Big Bass Podcast is all about bass fishing's most storied tournament, the Bassmaster Classic. There's no bigger or brighter stage in the world of competitive fishing than the Classic, and no more sought-after title than Bassmaster Classic Champion. And, you know, although it seems like uh, you could divide serious anglers uh, in the world of bass fishing between those who like to fish competitively and those who target big fish, the Classic, which has a, a daily creel limit of just five fish, is a place where those two can come together, at least to a degree. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, especially if you catch the biggest fish, right? I mean, it, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to boost your weight up in the whole nine yards. But let, let's, you know, look back at, at the classic and how it began real briefly. You know, you have Ray Scott and, and Bob Cobb that by 1970, the end of the season of 1970, they've got this tournament circuit that they've put together and, they're feeling that they need to have some sort of a championship to, to crown the world champion of bass fishing. And so Ray Scott and Bob Cobb, I guess they're driving, you know, to Atlanta one day, and they cook up this idea of having the Bassmaster Classic. It's going to be at a mystery lake. Uh, no one will know what it is. Their anglers are only going to be restricted to four or five rods and 10 pounds of tackle. Everybody's going to fish out of the same boat, the whole nine yards. Uh, it's a full level playing field at a lake that hopefully none of them have ever fished. And uh, that first Bassmaster Classic was just that. It was at Lake Mead. Everybody got on a, 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 an airplane uh, in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, I believe. I, I think was they got the, on a plane in Atlanta. Atlanta. Was it Atlanta? Okay. Yeah, it was usually Atlanta or New Orleans. They got on the plane. Okay, but. so yeah, so they, they get on a, a plane. Uh, nobody knows where they're going. Uh, they get to 10,000 feet elevation. Ray Scott grabs the microphone from the stewardess, and that's what they were called at the time, and uh, announces, this is Ray Scott, and you're all on. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. I, go, I, I just want to make an important Scott. point. This is Ray Scott, and you're all headed to... Las Vegas, and we're fishing Lake Mead, Nevada. <laughs> but that's 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 absolutely correct. But you know what he did, Terry? He ripped open an envelope an like envelope. he was at the Oscars, and he pulled yes. it out, and then he said, "We're heading to Las Vegas, Nevada, and Lake Mead," as though he didn't already know where they were going. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the consummate showman, Ray Scott. The yeah. consummate showman. He was one of a handful of people who knew where they were going, and yet he's got to have the big envelope moment and of course yeah. they, they they fish the classic at mead it's ultimately won by bobby murray but we're talking about big bass and, and there were yeah. prizes each day at that classic for big bass ray paid the guys in poker chips basically you got a hundred dollars in poker chips for every pound of the fish you caught and day one's leader in the big bass chase was bob ponds he caught a 414 and uh if you don't know the name bob ponds you probably know the name pete ponds uh yep Pete is Bob's son, longtime Bass Pro, former Elite Series guy, terrific, uh, terrific mm -hmm. angler, uh, great historian of the sport. Well, Bob caught the day one lunker. Day two, Bob Pond's record gets broken. Bobby Murray, the guy who ultimately wins the tournament, catches a fish that weighs six pounds, five ounces. And day three, record falls again, Terry. Yep. Again, three Roland days in Martin. a row. This time Roland it's Roland Martin, Martin time. with a yep. six-pound, nine-ounce fish. So... Uh, but Roland, Roland's record hangs on for a couple of years. Uh, in 1973, they go to Clark's Hill. Yep. Yeah, so they go to Clark's Hill. This is the, the, the event that uh, Ray O'Breckenridge wins. 
But on day one, Wallace Lee breaks Roland Martin's two-year record with a 615. Unknown lure, you know, how he caught it or whatever. And then it, the, the record stands for three more years until the 1976 Classic when we're at Lake Gunnersville. And guess who breaks that record? It would be Rick Klun. And very interesting. When we say Rick Clunn breaks yeah. that record, we're we're absolutely being accurate. If anybody wants, if anybody ever asks you, uh, who broke Wallace Lee's classic big bass record, the correct answer technically uh, is Rick Clunn. Rick Clunn caught a seven thirteen on day two. This is mm -hmm. a day he caught uh, the heaviest, he had the heaviest bag in the history of the classic, thirty three pounds five ounces. It was a ten yep. fish limit then, uh, but it's still the heaviest overall daily catch in classic history. Mm -hmm. And it was the first of Clun's four Bassmaster Classic wins. So Clun goes up there. He's got this massive bag of fish, including the 713. But but Clun only holds on to the record for about five minutes, Terry. Yeah. Mr. Consistency, Ricky Green, then drops an 8-9 on the scales and uh, takes takes the wind out of uh, Clun's sails with respect to the to the classic record. Uh, and again, this happened on day two. So from 1976, that record stood for 30 years. Uh, and uh, it, it would get broken on the Kissimmee chain. Is that how you pronounce it, Ken? I, uh, the Kissimmee from, chain. The Kissimmee chain. not from chain. America. Sorry about Terry's that. A, Terry's yeah. a foreigner from I'm California by now in Tennessee. <laughs> so the Kissimmee chain... Uh, of lakes, and that's where stuff is going to, I mean, records are going to fall daily, minute by minute, and, and, and all that. But there's another really cool classic record that, that Ken dug up out of the archives that I think, Ken, why don't you talk about Jay Ellis? Yeah, and, and Jay, yeah, in, in, in 2002, Jay, I'm sorry, 2003, Jay Yellis won the Bassmaster Classic, and uh, he, he was a, a fairly dominant performance. But where he really dominated, Terry, was in the Daily Lunkers. Every yeah. single day of that Bassmaster Classic, all three days of the Classic, Jay Yellis had big fish. And, and that's yep. a, a, very occasionally a guy will have big fish on two of the three days, but Yellis mm -hmm. is the only guy ever to do it for all three days. And obviously that's a record that can't be broken. That can only be tied. Uh, quite impressive, though, in 2002. Exactly. Uh, but going back to 2006, uh, you know, at this point, going into that tournament on the Kissimmee chain, uh, Ricky Green has the record, 8 pounds, 9 ounces from Gunnersville 30 years earlier. Yep. The first guy to eclipse Green's weight was actually a guy named Mark Tucker, one of my favorite people from the trail. Just a wonderful guy who fished the elites for quite a while. Yep. Uh, now retired his, from professional fishing. His dad was Mac Tucker, who was a stick in the Midwest uh, in the in the early '70s, the early days of the uh, Midwest uh, tournament bass fishing. So yeah, Mark came from a a good line, a good lineage. And, and, you know, everybody expected the records to fall in, in Orlando, Terry, on the Kissimmee chain because they were yep. going to Florida. It was going to be pre-spawn or spawn. There were going to be a lot of sight fishing going on, a lot of big fish. Uh, because the reason the record stood for 30 years is because bass rarely took the classic to bodies of water where it was going to be viable to break 8 pounds, 9 ounces. For gosh sake, they went to the Ohio River three times. Uh, you're yeah. not Your best 10 fish might not weigh eight pounds, nine ounces on the Ohio River. So well, Tucker's the and first Plus, they were also it. fishing the classic in the summer and, and the fall, right? Where so big fish are harder your... to come by. Exactly, exactly. So they changed the season up, uh, and uh, they go a to great Kissimmee. Point. They go to Kissimmee. The very first and, uh, year. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of people may not know the reason they went to the Kissimmee chain that year, but Bass had just relocated its offices from Montgomery, Alabama, where they had been since their inception in 1968. Mm -hmm. They had just moved to Celebration, Florida, which is basically a, a suburb of Orlando. And they had incurred a lot of moving expenses. I was part of their moving expenses. And so they were looking to have a, a nice cheap classic at a kind of a, a sexy destination with a lot of potential for big fish and so forth. Uh, the, the, the CEO at the time, uh, Don Rucks, wanted to start things off with a bang. Uh, it was the first late winter springtime classic. And, and it, it did start with a bang. Day one was a bomb of a great day. 
Uh, <laughs> Mark Tucker's the first guy to cross the scales with a fish to beat Ricky Greens. He's got a 912. But there were four other guys who, who eclipsed Ricky Greens' fish that day. Edwin Evers had an 815. Uh, yep. Preston Clark had a 9. Mm -hmm. uh, Rick Clun had a 1010. And Preston Clark had a fish bigger than a 9, believe it or not. He had a 9, and he had one that weighed 11 pounds, 10 ounces. Yep. Yep. And That's... Hey, it's insane. I mean, you've got what fifty pounds of fish right there with five fish. You know, yeah, yeah. That's impressive in one tournament on in one, one tournament, day. In one day. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, unfor those of us like Terry and I who were there, we remember that a cold front was coming through that day one. So a lot of those fish that have been on the bed, that have been up shallow, uh, vulnerable to the sight fishermen, they scattered to the winds and went to the heavy cover uh, after that, and things were tougher. But on day two. Uh, Terry Scroggins, terrific Florida pro, also eclipsed Ricky Green's mark with a nine pound, five ounce fish. Uh, by yep. the time day three rolls around, a fish I think less than six pounds was big, big fish for that day. But yep. uh, that one rewrote the record books uh, for BASS and Big Bass. And um, Terry and I uh, are going to have Ot Defoe, because we're going to do a countdown to the top five for you folks right now. And we're going to start with number five, Ot Defoe right about now hey everybody in a discussion of the biggest bass and bass master classic history uh you got to start with ot defo ot's got a tremendous record to catch in big bass in the classic number five number five all time with a nine pound nine ounce fish uh we've got Ot on screen but before i formally introduce him i want to tell you this guy's a a very underrated big fish angler he has four Daily Big Bass and Elite Series competition, uh, a tremendous record in the Bassmaster Classic. Ott, thanks for joining us in the Big Bass Podcast. Absolutely. Glad to be on here, Ken. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, you and Terry both for having me on here. Uh, absolutely Anytime. our pleasure. Now, Terry, here's something I bet you don't know, and Ott doesn't think I come up with these stats on my own, so he thinks I have to go out and recruit <laughs> school children to do the math for me. But if you take no, all the it. guys who have class, who, if you take all the anglers, more than 700, who have qualified for the Bassmaster Classic through the 50 odd years, and, and you take the guys who have made at least five classics, Ott Defo has the best average finish in classic history. Ott's been to eight classics. He finishes on the average in the 84th percentile. In eight classic appearances, he made the cut every time. He's been in the top 11 seven times five times in the Super 6. This guy has an argument for being one of the all-time great classic performers. So That's I, insane. Yeah. It's, it's ridiculous how strong you've been in the classic on, the, on, the, on one of the sport's biggest stages. Uh, that, that was a, a string I was very proud of, to be quite honest. That, and that lone finish outside of the 11th was at, was at Grand Lake, and it was just, I don't know what happened in that one. Just really didn't get it, you know, just kind of didn't get it going on. But, um, but yeah, the rest of those had, had I think, two 11ths, and then everything was from six north, I believe, um, on the rest <laughs> yeah. of them. So, <laughs> and of course, and a yeah, win in 2019 on your home lake. So that was uh, the, the crown jewel of it all there for you in the classics. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, that that win at home, you know, on on home water, sleeping in your own bed for the Bassmaster Classic is something that a very rare, you know, few people have ever done. I, I truly don't know anybody else that. That has even you know Randy Howell live um, you know winning on Gunnersville he wasn't living there yet and, right um, Casey Ashley yeah. Casey mm -hmm. Ashley in South Carolina yeah. Edwin Evers yeah. in uh, Oklahoma but not mm -hmm. not sleeping in his own bed those guys were mm -hmm. uh, were a drive away but uh, you're yeah. you're in Blaine which as I understand is just basically a suburb of Knoxville where you've lived your whole life basically in the Knoxville area yeah yeah I have um, I'm the furthest I ever lived away from Knoxville was about the first 18 months that Jenny and I were married and lived in Dandridge so <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> you know 20 miles or 25 miles away from Knoxville but yeah it's all been within you guys within within Douglas? Really Knoxville. we were we were not living on Douglas we were newly married so we were not living on the lake uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we were, well you could have uh, been you could have been camping <laughs> <laughs> well I guess, I guess we could have yeah but we, we were very close to the lake but we were not on the lake Mm -hmm. Well, Ott's big fish uh, abilities have really shined in the classic as well. He's got mm -hmm. three daily big bass in classic history, despite the fact that he's only been to eight classics. The record, by the way, Ott, is to have four 
daily big bass in the classics. So uh, the guys who have the guys who have four have names like Clun, Van Dam, Evers, Yellis, Davy Height, and all those guys have basically twice as many or three or even four times as many appearances okay. as you. So right. that's something you you could have accomplished. The one yeah. we want to focus in on though, uh, is the fifth biggest all time. Yeah. And uh, that came on day three of the 2017 Classic on Lake yeah. Conroe in Texas. Yeah. And, uh, you know, not to rehash a, a tough couple of days, but you struggled on day one, found yourself in 25th place. Yeah. Um, day two, you actually had a better day, but you lost more ground to first place. Yeah. You probably didn't yeah. have a lot to fish for on day three. What were, your, what were your goals on day three of that Classic? You were trailing by over 13 pounds. Okay. Yeah, it's, I truly didn't remember just how, um, you know, just what the weights were. I, I do remember um, the first day having a limit, and and Ken, the, as much as you like like numbers and stuff, um, that was one of the that was one of the toughest events we ever fished uh, that I ever fished a class again for catching a limit. For one, the size limit was sixteen inches um, there on Conroe, and I had I remember I had a limit. I think I actually called once or twice. But I never caught a three pounder. I had eleven or twelve pounds or something in my limit. Um, and then the second day, I, I didn't realize that I knew I'd caught a much better bag, but I didn't realize that I had that I had fell back, you know, in the in the total weight that bad. Um, but the thing with Conroe was that it was a very volatile fishery. A guy would go out and catch eighteen, nineteen, twenty two pounds, whatever, and then the next day come in with three fish or four fish or something. So um, even though I knew I was behind some, it, it was a very volatile place. Um, and so, you know, going out that, that final day, you, Conroe's a place you can catch 30 pounds, um, you know. So I, I truly didn't change much about the way I was fishing. I didn't change the areas I was fishing. Um, but I did, uh, you know, I, I do, what I do remember about that final day, the first bite I had gotten was a four or five pounder and I lost it. And then mm. the next bite I got was that nine pounder. And it was like mm. nine or 10 o'clock in the morning. If I remember right, when I caught that fish, it was well up into the day. Uh -huh. um, I did go on after that to end up finishing my limit. And not to toot my own horn, but just a stat, I was the only guy who caught a limit every day in that classic. If I remember right, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, you would know that. But I'm 99% sure I was the only guy that caught a limit every day wildly impressive it was extremely high water as i recall the conditions were super duper tough uh you always catch the limit you're one of those guys who who always seems to catch a limit and that's uh been such a, a strong point in your career i think now uh what people don't realize is not only was that the the fifth largest bass ever caught in classic history but it's the biggest bass ever caught on the final day and to show you just how money okay. Ot Defoe is on the final day of the classic. He has two of the three biggest bass ever caught on the final day of the Bassmaster Classic because um, he did it also in 2014 oh. on Gunnersville. He's not good at catching his computer as it falls, <laughs> but he's pretty good at catching big fish. Yeah, well, well the, the inner, uh, what I was trying to do, um, I've got hanging on a net right here behind me. And just so it happened, well, sorry all that everybody if you're if you're now <laughs> sick or anything watching this I, but th this is going to really add to the story of this really well if i can i'm just going to have to change my angle a little bit here we go okay um that that conroe fish i caught on not this exact bait yep. but it, it was this bait um but it was the a popper? different color uh, mm -hmm. it was that's a storm a rashi um popper yeah but it's cover pop is what they what they call this one from Storm, but um, that's that's the bait it was on. It was on a ghost pearl color, so basically just a, a pearl white version of that. And I believe still today that is my largest topwater fish I've ever caught. Um, but yeah, just I happen to have that hanging right here on the net behind me. Um, so so that's the actual bait right there that you caught the fish on. This is not the actual bait. It, it, it's this this bait, different color. Yeah, okay. this is not the actual bait. No. Where is the actual bait? I hope well, you're saving it somewhere. It, it's in my box to get used. <laughs> if, if you have the, the May, if you have the May 2017 issue of Bassmaster, it's actually right there. Okay. 
Well, um, you don't know that. We yeah. have to ask the man if that was the actual bait in the. In was, well, magazine. it says it says the uh, the the new cover pop from Rapala or Storm or Rashi, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, Ghost Pearl is what it says. Ghost Pearl Shad is what it says in the magazine too. So that is correct. It, well, well, having worked at that company for quite a while, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> that sometimes the stuff well we'll talk about that another time but uh but your best best fish ever on top water now had you had you encountered some good fish on that top water bait in practice or no, nothing like that no i i had i had caught some fish on it and and I, i'm trying to remember i think the first days i caught a fish or two on it maybe um but i i'm I know I caught a fish or two on it. I know I had some bite it that I missed and ended up going back and catching on a wacky worm. Because a lot of those fish were, were fish that were spawning, fish I was targeting right. with that with that popper were spawning fish. Um and uh and that was that was kind of what I was, was doing with that. Um but on that final day that was what I had I had hung a four or five pounder on that had came off and then ended up um up in the morning catching that catching that giant one on, yeah. So tell us a little bit about the the structure and the the cover you were working, yeah, the depth so, stuff like that. Yeah, it, it was it was very shallow. Um, the a big thing with Conroe at that point in time, um, the lake had been down for I'm going to say an extended period of time. I don't know if it was two years or four years, whatever it was, but the lake had been had been lower for a, a number of years and it had allowed a lot of undergrowth to grow up and there was a lot of small sticks you know kind of stuff like that um that had grown up in that and it was in that foot to two and a half foot range and i mean it was literally just you'd go in a cove and it kind of lined that depth range around the around the banks and stuff and there were fish spawning in that and they and some of them were spawning around stumps but it was just you know covered with this other stuff as well so it gave them it gave them some extra cover and that was a lot of what i was what I was targeting was any additional pieces of wood that kind of had this other undergrowth, I'm going to call it, that had, you know, that was kind of in that same area, but very, very shallow. I mean, that, that fish, it came out of 18 inches of water or so. Um, it, it was, it was very, very shallow. Um, and, and I, I, I actually have that fish catch on my YouTube channel. Um, it's, course way back in the archives at this point but it's had over a hundred thousand views of maybe maybe a couple hundred thousand at this point but it was a I, I had i had made the cast and i remember a lot of this because i've watched it again a time or two since because it was just a really cool really cool fish catch but you know i had made the cast oh, up there and I had, I had worked the bait and of course the momentum of the boat i mean i'm you know i'm just covering water fishing as i'm going and, and I'm working, working the bait, you know, so the rods in my left hand, I'm wor working, working. And then I have to go back and look for sure, but I feel like the rod is in my off hand because the boat was working away from it. And as I'm working the bait, I actually saw the fish come up and kind of move under the bait. You know, it's kind of, mm -hmm. kind of tracking it like that. And so I'm just, I, I know I've got the rod in one hand. I don't remember for sure if it's my correct hand, which would be my left for, the way I'm fishing or if like I had switched hands to kind of give more line because it's on the right hand side of the boat and the boat's drifting away from it. And I'm just twitch, twitch, twitch. And the fish comes up. It's out of frame on the video, but it comes up and eats the bait. And I one handed, uh. I set the hook into the fish because I've got the <laughs> momentum of the boat working with me. I one handed set the hook into the fish and, you know, and then begin, begin fighting. And it comes up and jumps like crazy beside the boat. Um, uh, yeah, it was a that, that was a pretty fun one. <laughs> Re so, retire that bait, Adi. Retire it. <laughs> Take it out of your boat. Put it on a wall. Put it in a shadow frame with a picture. Come on, man. That 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 bait caught the biggest bass in the history of the day day three at the classic. I probably will at this point. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't realize that it was the biggest day three bass. Ever. The fifth the ranking number five, I'm like, yeah, okay, that, that's pretty cool. But knowing that it's the biggest day through, I'll retire for that. I'll, I'll do that for you, Ken. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry, Terry. I interrupted. I interrupted so, your so important question. What what rod reel, and, and most importantly, what line were you throwing? Yeah, that would have been on a Bass Pro uh, six six um, carbon light medium action rod. 
I'm trying to think. That probably would have been a probably would have been a carbon light reel as mm-hmm. well, a, a either six to eight or a seven five to one gear ratio. And then at that point in time, I always use monofilament on that. I kind of went back and forth with braid now at this point, um, but it would have been 17 pound Bass Pro uh, monofilament line would have been been what I was using on that. Um, with that, it's it's always a short cast. I'm never making longer than a 30 foot cast or something with that. That's why I always went with monofilament because it is such tight quarters. I, I go with braid more now um, and just you know, just kind of gear myself to not jerk as hard or anything. But, um, yeah, back then it, it was always monofilament for that yeah. particular technique. Uh, you've been so successful at, at catching big fish in competition. Uh, do you deliberately target big fish when you're out there in competition, or do you just hope to find them by going through numbers of fish? For me, it truly has always been more about going through numbers of fish. You know, if, if I'm in a situation – where I, I have a deal that I know I can target, um, you know, can target bigger ones for, um, then I, I'll certainly try to mix that in at some point in time. But that that stat on the limit side of my fishing, that is one that I I just man I I could never turn off. And so it was always really important for me to catch a limit first. If it meant that I was fishing a way to catch big ones, then that was all the better. But um, it was always, always so important for me to try to fill my limit first um, and get that out of the way, and then I could figure out what I need to do to try to try to target bigger fish from there. Now, um, a handful of guys, uh, yourself, uh, Edwin Evers, Jacob Wheeler, Jordan Lee, others, of course, too, but have been successful in in both the the five fish limit format and the every fish counts format. You guys are, are basically going back to, to five fish now with MLF. Is that a change you like because you're so good at, at catching big fish? Or were you just as happy with every fish counts? I, I loved every fish counts. Um, I, I truly did. I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. And I will always feel like it made me a better fisherman. I, I absolutely believe that. The, the frantic pace, <clears throat> the frantic pace of it and, um, you know, knowing that, any fish you catch is going to, you know, over a scoreable size, every one of those fish is going to help you. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And, and, and again, and I think part of the reason that I did enjoy it so much is that it, I, I feel like it, it pushed, it, it pushed me to, to make adjustments quicker. If I'm not getting bit by whatever size fish, I need to make adjustments quicker because you're going to be falling behind. And once we went to the two pound minimum part of it, we weren't fishing for little fish anymore. Every place we went essentially had a 16 or 17 inch size limit at that point. I mean, that's what a, that's what a two pound fish is other than a pre-spawn fish. That's extremely healthy. That's 15 and a half inches. Um, you know, you're just, you're, you're not fishing for sub keepers anymore at that point. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. And now we have fished one event under a five fish format to date. Um, I give God all the glory for having a good event there, finished third place in it. Um, having five fish and score tracker knowing exactly where you are was really cool. It, it was because you know you know what a three pounder is going to do for you. Not that you didn't before, but you would get you would get greater separation where you know, man, I just need a six ounce coal. And it's going to do this for me, you know, so it, it makes those, it makes those so much tighter and being in a place like Florida where any swing of the back could be a six, seven, eight pounder and be a three, four, five, six, whatever pound cull, your potential is just, it's so much greater versus being 10 or 12 pounds behind and be like, man, I need to catch two or three good ones, or I need to catch, I need to go find a place to catch six or eight fish real fast, you know, any of that kind of stuff. So. But it, but it, wouldn't it also uh, enable you to, you, once you know that you're, you know, you're ahead by 18 ounces or you're behind by eight ounces, it'll give you an opportunity to either go practice for tomorrow yeah, uh, or stop burning your fish, right? Yeah, it, it, it did. And, and, but we also had that with, with every fish as well. You know, we truly did because I had, I had a bunch of events um, to where I had, 
no, this is every fish counts. And this was in the first year or two with major league fishing where we'd be on those events where it's not a St. Lawrence river or a place like that, where, you know, it was taking astronomical weights where the fishing was mediocre, but maybe not great. I had a bunch of those where I, I made the two day cut in the first two periods of the, of the, of my first round of competition, you know, so you get to that point and I'd always, I was yeah. always a, keeping up with it, you know, okay. At the right. end of period one, the cut weights, eight pounds in the period two cut weights, 15 pounds. So it, Went up eight the first period, didn't quite go up eight the next. Let's just go ahead and add nine to it. And, you know, so you could kind of triple that while I'm already at 40, 32, 42 pounds, whatever it was. And I'm safe in two periods. You know, I, I had those kind of events too. So, um, gotcha. With, with, with five, the, with five fish versus every fish, it's restrictor plate racing is exactly what it is. You can only get so far ahead. You can only get so far behind. The problem with it is if you get too far behind, you now cannot make it up. With St. Lawrence River, every fish counts, you could still make it up. You go to the St. Lawrence River with a five fish limit and you catch 12 pounds. There's, yeah. um, you're done. You go ahead and load it up and go on to the house because you're, you're not going to, you're not going to recover from that. You could blank one day with every fish counts and come back and still make the cut. That kind of stuff is true at a lot of smallmouth venues, though, don't you think? Uh, that, oh, yeah. Yeah. Where, where the guy who wins is averaging three and three quarter pounds, and the guy who finishes 50th is averaging three and a quarter pounds. I mean, mm -hmm. there's not really a lot of difference, but except in the standings. Right. Uh, you, right. if, you really want, if you really want a lot of movement in the standings, what you need is a place like Conroe, where limits are hard to come by, and there are some really big fish. Florida Correct. is is like that pretty much from from uh, the Keys to the Panhandle. It's just yeah. like that. But yeah. but wherever you've gone, man, you've you've always been man been able to catch limits. You always managed to find big fish. Uh, folks, Ot Defoe, one of the he's still a young guy, but already one of the all timers and uh, a master at catching big fish in competition, and, and one of the best people in the sport too. Ot, thanks so much for spending some time with us on the Big Bass Podcast. Thanks, Absolutely, Art. Ken. And yeah, Terry, thank you. And um, I, I really appreciate appreciate those kind words, especially with the tag on your hat. I know that that's, uh, you know, I don't know if everybody knows exactly where that came from, but I take a lot of explain. pride in it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I blame Ott for that. Ott, Ott gives me a hard time. Oh. Ott's, Ott's not the nice guy he appears. Actually, Ott's a really super nice guy, but he's also very mischievous. <laughs> um, I've watched many times out in boat yards where guys are, are getting their gear put just away, just this special way. And then they'll walk away for a few minutes and Ott will rearrange everything in their boat. <laughs> yep. I, 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 any, any leg you can get that's within the rules. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, Ott's a fabulous guy, honest as the day is long, but you do have to watch him. I'm just saying that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, man, I, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for the cool story about a, a giant in the Bassmaster Classic. And I will retire that bait. Thank you. Do Thank that. You. Well deserved. Yep. All right. See Take care, man. See you good. soon. Thank you very much. All right. So we have Ott now uh, at number five. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to go to actually number three, which is a tie between Brett Ayler and Mark Tucker. And Ayler's fish came in 2017 at Lake Conroe. Uh, if you guys remember that tournament, that was another tough Bassmaster Classic. Uh, and, uh, of course, you know, Ott, we just got done talking to Ott. Uh, he caught his, his big fish at that Classic, and uh, Ayler catches his 912. Uh, Ayler led day one by one pound, two ounces, and anchored by that, that nine pound, 12 ounce fish uh, that is now... A, tied for third biggest bass in Bassmaster Classic history. Uh, the bait that he caught it on was a Yamamoto uh, Custom Baits D-Shad in Watermelon, and he was using a 3 uh Gamakatsu EWG hook. Yeah, that uh, bait is basically just a soft plastic jerk bait, kind of like a fluke. Yeah, and it, and it was uh, designed by Derek Yamamoto, uh, and I believe it was the Konami line of, of baits that, that Derek was you know, trying to offshoot from Yamamoto at the time. Uh, and uh, Ayler held the lead, uh, you know, day one, and then continued on in, in day two 
but on day three, he stumbled and ended up finishing third in that tournament. But he's got big fish number three for the best Master Classic all-time top five biggest. And, of course, Terry, he's tied with Mark Tucker, a fish we've talked about a little bit uh, yep. that Mark Tucker caught on day one of the 2006 Classic on the Kissimmee Chain of Lakes here in Florida. Mm -hmm. And as we mentioned, Tucker was the first guy to weigh in a Bassmaster Classic bass bigger than Ricky Green's 8-pound, 9-ounce fish from 1976. Tucker mm -hmm. didn't have a great tournament. Um, he ranked 17th after day one. Uh, and and what's, what's really terrible, I think, is that Mark's fish got lost in the shuffle. There were so many giant fish coming across the stage that day that a lot of people forgot that Mark was actually the first guy to break Ricky Green's mark. And uh, I, I, in, in reviewing the coverage from Bassmaster that year, on that year's classic, Mark Tucker didn't get a mention in there. Uh, the only no. place that he was reported was in the Bass Times coverage. And uh, But, hey, can't take it away from Mark. Mark's got the... Th tied for the third biggest bass in classic history with Brent Ayler at nine pounds, 12 ounces. Yep. And number two, again, you know, uh, it, it's, it's Rick Clun and Rick Clun's 10, 10 at the 2006 classic again, you know, we, we, we mentioned it earlier. Uh, but yeah, no, Rick's got, Rick's got number two, uh, in, in, in the biggest bass that have ever been weighed at a Bassmaster classic. Now a little bit about Clun, uh, 32 classic experiences or uh, appearances, or, or experiences. Wins. I like experiences. Yeah, I think that's yeah, a, yeah, good, yeah. a good. He mood. had he had probably more than 32 experiences. Probably probably classic. a few more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he had four wins. He had back to back wins in '76 and '77, then '84, and then 1990. Uh, he won four daily big bass awards. Uh, 1976 on day one, 1977 on day one, uh, ended up being the big fish for that bass, uh, master classic. Um, 1981, day two, 1987, day three, again, big bass for that bass master classic. He twice held the record for the biggest bass master classic lunker, uh, only to be surpassed moments later, you know, by Ricky Green. And again, and that was the 1976. So what are the Clun. odds? Yeah, Clun becomes the first guy to crack 10 pounds in a Bassmaster Classic. Suddenly he's got all the <laughs> records, Terry. He's got them yeah. all. Yeah. He, he's, he's got four Classic Championships. At that point, uh, you know, Van Dam, who ultimately tied him with four Classic wins, but at that point Van Dam only had two. So mm -hmm. Clun's got the most Classic wins. He's Now he's got big fish in the Classic. It's all his. The Classic is is his oyster. And I still believe that Rick Clun is the greatest Bassmaster Classic competitor in history, but oh, yeah. for a few moments in 19, in, I'm sorry, in 2006, he had it all only to be surpassed by Preston Clark just moments later. Yeah. What are that's... the odds? What are the odds? The same oh, guy 30 years later. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it, yeah, 30 years later in 1976, it's taken from him and 2006, it's taken from him. Like you say, five minutes after after he, he gets the uh, the record. Um, I guess it's just the luck of the draw, you know, but I don't think Rick will ever complain about his career. I mean, he's he's done everything in bass fishing. Um, you know, I, everybody knows that he's never satisfied. That's why he's still competing at, you know, post seven. Still believing his best days are ahead of him, and, and you got to admire that. Now, yep. Clun, Clun did not have a great classic. Uh, as we said, he won four, so he knew what a great classic was like. But he yeah. ranked fifth after day one. Uh, he mm -hmm. weighed in 20 pounds, 12 ounces. Uh, so that one fish was more than half his weight on yeah. day one, Terry. And yep. uh, he caught that fish on a, a Lucky Strike Trickster spinnerbait that had those oblong kind of teardrop uh, blades, blades on it. And yep. uh, he wound up finishing the tournament in 21st place. And that 10-pound, uh, that 10, 10 ounce fish was more than one-third of his total <laughs> weight for the Derby. Yep. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, if you're Rick, you're never satisfied. But, I mean, when he looks back on his career, I guarantee you that uh, he, he's not going to be disappointed. No, you know, and, and for anybody who can find it, and I, I assume it's somewhere on the Bassmaster.com website, but don't dare leave the Big Bass podcast to go there. Um, check it out because the video of Rick catching that fish is, is really quite moving. 
uh, it, it just goes to show you that a guy who at that point in his career was 60 years old, yeah. um, he, uh, he collapses on his boat deck, just breathing heavy, so excited, thrilled with the catch, just shows you the kind of passion that he has for the game. Um, well worth revisiting if, and well worth checking out if you haven't seen it before. Yep. And I, I'd have to say the, the, the coverage of him fishing the St. John's, a couple of years ago when he won with those two big fish that he weighed. It's the same thing. I mean, here you got a, now you've got a 70 year old who's uh, just excited and thrilled. And I mean, he's like a kid, you know, in it, with excitement. Uh, it's, it's crazy the amount of big fish or fish that have come across his deck and he still gets excited, you know, when he catches a good one. So do you want to talk about number one? We're just going to tease number one, Terry, because we're cruel, <laughs> and that's the way we operate here at the Big Bass Podcast. But number one, I, I hope everybody knows by now, we mentioned it earlier in the program, the biggest bass in the history of the Bass Master Classic is a massive 11-pound, 10-ounce largemouth bass caught by Preston Clark and uh, of Palatka, Florida. And, and Preston is a wonderful guy. He fished a few years in the Elite Series, set some impressive marks there. Uh, we're going to have Preston on in our next episode, so stay tuned for that. Uh, we're dedicating the entire episode of that one to Preston and his giant fish from the 2006 Classic uh, on the Kissimmee Chain of Lakes. So uh, come on back for that one. Uh, yep. We know you're going to enjoy it. Preston's got some great stories about it. And uh, also, we're going to dig we're going to dig deep, uh, probably even a little deeper than we did with Ot Defoe, about his theories and attitudes and approaches to targeting big fish in competition. Uh, we're going to go into all that with Preston. Uh, I think it's going to be enlightening. I know I will be taking notes because, like Preston, I'm a Floridian, and I know he's got a lot to teach me <laughs> about targeting big fish here in Florida. Without a doubt. And the cool thing is is that this tournament was a year or two prior to power poles and blades. So we're going to get an old-school education on how to use a push pole to, to, to bed fish. It's going to sneak be, up on these fish. It's going to be really, really cool. So uh, come on back uh, next week, and, and uh, we'll be talking to, to Preston Clark about his classic record. You know, Terry, one of my one of my takeaways here on on our researching and digging into the big bass from the Bassmaster Classic is that while while catching a, a big fish in the Bassmaster Classic, you know, the sport's biggest brightest stage is i think everybody's goal i think i think anybody who loves competition in big fish dreams of that uh but you know what it, it very very rarely pays off in a win of the anglers who caught the 15 biggest bass in Bassmaster classic history absolutely none of them won the tournament none no. of them mm -mm. And in fact the best finish in that group was third by ricky green in 1976 and, and by brent ayler in 2017 uh, only seven times in classic history, and we're talking, we're talking. Though this will in nineteen, I'm sorry, oh. two thousand twenty-three. It'll be the fifty-third Bassmaster Classic, and so yep. far only seven times in classic history did the angler who caught the biggest bass of the tournament win the championship, and it hasn't been done since two thousand seven when Boyd Duckett did it. Yeah, it's uh, you know, I don't know how you can explain it. You know, you would think that the a guy that you know caught a big fish. If he limited the the other days, he might have a chance. But it's just the way uh, just the way stuff goes, you know. So, and let's discuss the hat. <laughs> okay, we got to discuss the hat. I, I, if if y'all watched the uh, entire episode, you saw our interview with Ot Defo, wonderful guy, one of my favorite people in the sport. Uh, I wore this hat for that because Ot was the inspiration, the cause of this hat that I bought maybe 10, almost 10 years ago, not, not quite. Uh, but in 2013, uh, I was working for BASS, and um, I was at the uh, media day for the Classic, which is the Thursday before the Classic begins. And uh, I had one question I wanted to ask every pro who qualified at that event. My question was, if you can't win this derby, who would you like to see win? I just wanted to see who kind of the, the angler's favorite was in that group. And I believe that that Todd Faircloth actually wound up getting the most picks. Uh, he's such a nice guy, it's not surprising. Well, anyway, uh, Ott is also a wonderful guy, except Ott has a vicious sense of humor sometimes. And uh, <laughs> um, 
So I see he's talking to Louis Stout, longtime Bassmaster senior writer, absolutely one of the best journalists in the business. And I don't use the word journalist lightly. There, there are a handful of them in the sport, uh, and Louis is one of them. So uh, anyway, I see Louis talking to him, but I only need one question. Louis is a good friend of mine. Ah, oh, it's a friend of mine. So I figure I'm going to maybe make a joke of it and kind of barge in, ask my one question and go. So I say, excuse me, excuse me, real media coming through. And uh, <laughs> Louis turns to see what's, what's going on. And, and Ott looks at me and says, all right, Ken, where are they? Where's the real media? <laughs> Implying it wasn't me. <laughs> and uh, so the next year I come to the classic wearing my, my fedora with my real media badge. And, uh, but from that point forward, as long as Ott was in the classic, he would always come up to me on media day, make a big point of checking my badge to see that Your I was friends. properly credentialed. <laughs> so that's, that's a little uh, taste of who Ott Defoe is and his sense of humor. He's a wonderful guy. We really appreciate Ott taking the time out of his evening to yep. join us for this episode. Yep. Which I think means it's time. I think it's time to slam the door on this episode of the Big Bass Podcast, Ken. Uh, Let's do it, man. Before, yeah, so uh, before we go, please remember to subscribe, like, share, give us a comment or a review. We love talking to you guys, you know, in the comment sections. Uh, it's a small ask, but it's a, it's a big help for us to, to, to make sure that, that, you know, this podcast gets off the ground. Uh, and don't forget to check out the website, uh, thebigbasspodcast.com. Uh, you'll find all our Big Bass Podcast calculator, uh, our listings for record bass, plus supplementary material on the episodes. It's a work in progress, uh, but you, if you like the show, you're going to love the website. Uh, if you want to contact us, our email addresses are ken at thebigbasspodcast.com, terry at thebigbasspodcast.com, nathan at thebigbasspodcast.com, I'm Terry Battisti, and on behalf of my partners, Ken Duke and Nathan Benson, thanks for our special guest, Ott the Foe, of course, and to you for joining us. Uh, next week, we'll have a new show about a different big bass with a story that you will not and cannot find anywhere else. And remember, size matters.